It seems that as long as I've been an adult, people have always been talking about the expense or the extreme cost of raising children. And today we're going to discover a ways to overcome some of those costs and to make them not, not quite so um, so so uh, financially crippling sometimes to people. Uh, it takes planning, but just like anything else in life, planning often provides us a way to avoid certain pitfalls that come along in life. Not that everything that we do and plan happens specifically the way we planned it, but without a plan, things are pretty much just chaos. That's right. Well, you're listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. It's Tom and John in the studio today. And for this topic, we have a very fitting guest, my mom, Michelle. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And you know, I, I've never raised children, and so I'm a little bit out of place uh, discussing this topic uh, just, just by myself, but you definitely have a lot of experience uh, in this area. And then, um, as the oldest of eight children, uh, I know you've I know you've done an, a wonderful job in our family. So, hey, all right. Thank you very much, John. So we're going to talk about how much it costs to raise a child. Well, you know, scanning uh, the Internet and looking at different uh, people's opinions about this, it seemed like there was a, a strong coalition to say that it takes about $225,000 to raise a child from infancy through 12th grade. Nope. Wow. So that's uh, conventional wisdom. And that's not talking about educational costs. If you put them in private school or it's not talking about, uh, you know, their college. This is just from birth till the time they get out of high school. Wow. Wow. And so I would like to say, says who, but you're saying it's Mr. Internet, and Mrs. Internet, and <laughs> Ms. Internet, and all these people on the Internet seem to have this uh, agreement of about 225000 And isn't that interesting? It's probably those same people out of New York and people in Oklahoma and people <laughs> all over where, where costs widely vary. And you know, what is involved in raising a child anyway? It, doesn't that vary? It varies so significantly. I mean, just think of, of the, the cost in putting one or two children into extracurricular sports activities or drama or ballet or any of these things, how that changes the whole financial dynamic of a family. Because now we've got this practice we've got to go to at 4.30, and this practice we've got to go through at 6.30, and by the time we all get home at 7.30 or 8, oh, now mom has been running, uh, you know, like a crazy soccer mom all over the place and doesn't have time to, um, to put together a wholesome meal, so we're eating more fast foods, and we're and we're, we're going to have to stop at the um, at the gas station to get more gas on the way to get the fast food because you know we've got all these extra things that add up and and besides the convenience of those foods now we've got the cost of maybe our health care because we don't get the nutrition that we need for these growing children, uh, much less the parents, um, that, that these growing bodies are needing. And so we are going to have a toll on our health, which is going to increase um, medical costs. It's going to increase the conveniences we need to take care of these uh, health things that come uh that come about these these problems that we have because you know when we're not feeling well we have to uh, take care of ourselves a little differently and so expenses change at that time. Well, this goes back to what I've heard ever since I can remember um, adults in my young childhood talking about um, whether you know it takes a two parent income to raise a family, and you know by the time I was in high school. Uh, everybody's mom and dad were working, it seemed like, um, to afford the living, the standard of living that they wanted to provide their family. And yet when we first met, we determined that that wasn't going to happen. We were going to raise our kids with you being the motherly figure there for them all the time and me being the one that provided the income. 
and you know people kind of laughed at that philosophy because even at that time if they were saying oh no it it takes two people's income two parents income to raise a family and there's a ways to make that $225,000 per child um, not be so um, so large. And you were really instrumental, Michelle, in helping our family cut some of those costs. So why don't you share some of those things with our listeners today? Well, when you're at home taking care of your children, you don't have to you know, you're not running around. If, if you're not running around to a bunch of different extracurricular activities, you can save money on first the extracurricular activity. You can save money on the gas running around. You can save time so that you have time to prepare more nutritious meals at home that that require a little bit more time and preparation to have on the table and be prepared at a certain time. So, um, all of those things, redirecting your time and energy um, in a different way can allow you to save money. And then also, that doesn't mean your children just have to sit at home like a bump in the log. You change what kind of activities you're doing. So maybe you pick one extracurricular activity, or maybe you um, supplement with some extracurricular activities at home. Maybe it's bicycles, maybe it's blowing bubbles, maybe it's games in the yard, maybe it's work in the yard. Um, combination of all these different things, uh, extra sets of blocks and uh, being able to do creative things, things that aren't going to be spent up, you know, after a season of baseball or after a season of ballet, that's used up. And, and now you have the new expense for the next uh, nine to 12 weeks, whatever you're going to commit to, where you buy blocks and they're playing blocks. Well, they can improvise and do new and different things with blocks or or maybe add them to other things and you've got new activities new things happening and that's not to say anything that there's anything wrong with ballet or baseball or ex- certainly not you know extracurricular sports or drama or speech or things like that that you need to be involved in 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 having um, social activities it's just to say that our society has maybe, emphasize those too much at the expense of the family unit. And it's it's financially stressing as well as it is emotionally and mentally as, as far as the development of our children go. And I think it's really important to evaluate what things can you add in or take away to reduce some of these expenses. So extracurricular Curricular activities might be one of those places. Uh, Considering how to um, prepare meals or do meal planning, adding to some of that, um, working around a budget, uh, maybe do things that take a little bit more time and prep in the kitchen that can add variety to your meals and cut your budget at the same time. There's also um, other ways that you can spend your time differently. Maybe you do laundry a little bit more often and don't need to buy as many outfits. So you, um, you just designate your time and resources a little bit differently to help you meet your goals of not spending as much money so that you can use it in other areas. Yes, that's so true. And and let's just talk about that that, you know, quarter of a million dollars again to raise one child because <laughs> to me, um when we look back on the time that we raised our kids, um I don't think we made that much money the whole time our kids until they were adults that we made <laughs> that much money. So it it really I think comes across as a fear tactic sometimes to keep people from desiring to have a family. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as we have a family, we get more creative because, you know, I, I remember my brother saying, you know, the first child is great, the second child is great, the third child comes along, you wish you had a tra- travel trailer to pull because <laughs> one parent's got one child, one parent's got the other, and now you've mm-hmm. got the third, what do you do with that? Um, but you become creative in ways to overcome those obstacles. And, and we do that financially too. We find out that, 
oh, you know, Johnny uh, only wore these shoes for maybe two months before he wore out of them. Let's just set them aside because Ben is probably going to be able to wear those when he's Johnny's age. <laughs> yes. And then there's the other thing of a stroller. I mean, if you can choose to get a stroller that's um, maybe not all frilly pink in case the next child, uh, maybe you wouldn't want to put in a frilly pink stroller. Uh, just thinking more long term about your purchases of equipment Um I think that can be really important. And it, it kind of frustrates, frustrates me, Tom, that, you know, we saw the change uh, from when our kids were little uh, till some of the older or the later ones were born that it, it didn't used to be that car seats expired. Oh, and no. so, you know, the, the world is against us in some of the marketing and promotions that they do that now some car seats can expire. But maybe you have, you know, maybe the your car seat that isn't expired but wouldn't last for your next child could be given to a friend. And maybe you have another friend whose child has just grown out of a car seat that's about to expire. And so there can be this network where you kind of share some equipment, take good care of it, clean it up. Um, you know, a child doesn't use something for that long a period. So if you can, you know, use a little elbow grease, clean it up, make it nice, then you can really get away with not having to do a whole new purchase of an item uh, when something else is still perfectly good. And yeah, I guess you do have to work around the expiration date of a car seat. Yeah. <laughs> some you know, lobbying there. Yeah, you, you know, those are some really good ideas. Um, in there for, you know, being, being frugal, if you will. But it, 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 I, the way you're talking about it, this isn't a chore. This is a, uh, this is a, a desirable uh, a work that, that is worthwhile and fulfilling. Yeah, I never and, liked and you, the word chore yeah. because it sounded like a problem. So if I can think about how can I work, how can I contribute to make our life better with the resources we have, not what can I do for a chore today? Hmm. If I will change my attitude, then I can find activities that will lead to what I want for a goal. And you know, also this huge expense they're talking about for raising a child, do you have to double that for two children? <laughs> I don't think so. So there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I really do think this is a scare tactic, um, you're trying to pay, make people think that they can't do it, and that's not true. They can do it if they will put their mind to it and be creative in what they will put their hands to do so that they can do it successfully and under a budget. Mm -hmm. So I think you mentioned earlier that this 225000 does not include education costs. Is that right? It does not... Uh, it does not include college, and it does not include private education costs. Okay. So if there's so, if there's expenses in public education where there's extracurricular activities, that's included in sure. that. Okay. And so, so you know, Michelle, I think you can speak to this probably better than any of us because you were in that public educational realm before we were married and and um, and started our family, and you saw where the money in that system goes to. And uh, you might want to just talk a little bit about how that has drastically changed even, you know, 30 years ago when, 34 years ago when you were in that system. Well, you know, I remember uh, doing my student teaching and I felt really blessed to do student teaching uh, with a woman who had a lot of common sense and and uh, she, you know, a lot of teachers will spend even out of their own pocket to add to their classrooms. And this woman was not able to do that. She was on a, um, um, really on a budget that she was committed to. She had children of her own, and she did not have money that she could outlay from her own pocket to teach the children. So I really benefited from that because... She told, she showed me ways uh, to 
to have children do work, to have them be creative without a lot of out-of-pocket expense. So that was really a blessing to me um, to, to be in that position. But the whole education society, I mean, we see new schools going up all the time that are still overfilled. And um, John recently pulled up this statistic, and I have this paper in front of me, this graph actually, from Hillsdale College. And it um, shows the growth of population in public schools since uh, between 2000, 2019. So that's almost 20 years. And the number of students has increased by 7.6%. The number of teachers by 8.7%. So we're not getting more efficient in the way that we teach. We're actually needing more teachers now for students. And maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing. But what is very shocking is the next statistic. statistic, And that is administrators. (laughs) The administration uh, you know, students arose by 7.6%, teachers by 8.7%. I would ask y- the two of you to guess at what percentage it rose. But you've seen the chart. John, <laughs> I have you, seen the you, chart. You so, printed so, the, gr- so, the graph So if you're off. listening to this right now, just go ahead and take take two seconds and think what in your mind, you know, what, what would be a realistic growth for administration? With... Seven percent increase in children being taught. Seven point six. Seven point six. <laughs> okay. And about eight point seven percent increase in teachers actually being in the classroom. What increase have we seen in administrative since two thousand and two thousand nineteen? Okay. Just in, just in my mind, okay. if I hadn't seen this, it seems to me like around 20-something percent would have been pretty extravagant. Yeah. I mean, that would be well over double, double, more like triple. But are you ready for this? It is 87.6%. You need 87.6% more administration. That's crazy. And I'm just... Wondering if these uh, same people who are being needed as district administrators and deciding that we need district administrators are these ones that are saying it costs so much more to raise a child. Very well, they possible. Went, they <laughs> definitely want both parents working, so those tax dollars keep rolling in. <laughs> yeah. So to me, you know, and and you out there, I, I don't know, where were you? Were you at the 20%? Were you higher? Were you as high as 87.6%? That's more than a tenfold increase over students versus Huge. administrative. Yeah. And, you know, if an administrator is doing a good job, there should be a whole lot more um, people that he's administering, administering rather than, um, you know, that's like saying, you, you know, instead of one shepherd watching a thousand sheep, you need a thousand shepherds watching one sheep. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an upside down pyramid and it can't last that way. So yeah. who knows, but maybe some of these same people that are increasing the administration are telling us just how much it's going to cost us to raise children. And there's there's no doubt that it, there is an expense to raising children. And co- prices are rising and inflation is, is uh, you know, rising. But there are ways that we can make our money stretch. And that's what we like to share with people. You, the practicality about cooking, laundry, activities, the choices we make in our homes, but also what do we do with our dollars? Are we still, uh, are we spending every dime that comes in or do we still realize, hey, I can afford today's expenses and I can save for tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, um, I did a little... Um, homework to, for this podcast to to compare my own life because I was 30 when we got married and we had, um, you know, John was our firstborn. And if we would have been able to set aside $1,000 a year for, for John into a life insurance policy, then the money, that $225,000 would have been in the life insurance policy 
for us to use when we needed it. Now, what's interesting in raising a child, and many people don't know, the biggest expense come as they get older. You try to feed a teenager, okay? <laughs> yes, you try to keep a teenager <laughs> in clothing that's growing two and three inches a month, okay? There's many more expenses in the latter years than there are in the beginning years if we do it um, if we do it properly. And so setting aside that money in life insurance to begin with on my life would have provided enough money for you, Michelle, to continue to raise John if I hadn't been there, even though I didn't have an income. You wouldn't have been forced to go to work. You could have raised John just like we wanted to together financially because of the death benefit. But even more importantly, the money would have been there for the expenses that were necessarily um, to be met in our life because John was part of our family. And the nice thing is, is that when John turned 18, which was a number of years ago, John, right? It has okay. been a number of years ago. Then uh, just about ready to turn 31 now. We wouldn't have to have saved anymore in that life insurance policy, but that policy would have continued to grow and it would have been something that we could have used for our own retirement as well. And um, and then even after we used it for retirement, there would have still been money left over to pass on to John when we died mm -hmm. because of the death benefit. But these are the types of plans that are not really ever talked about because I think sometimes that those people that are directing society's emotions here or there with fear and get them to respond in a way that isn't in their best interest because that keeps them from planning properly, keeps them from being, oh, I can figure this out on my own. I don't need to have another expense here. Let's creatively do it this way, you know. Um, and, and all these things add to the cost in our life. And, you know, my mom always used to say, there's just way too many people trying to keep up with the Joneses. Mm -hmm. well, I never knew who the Joneses were. <laughs> but we were very happy as kids growing up with very, very little. And um, I had a patient who was uh, 104 years old when she told me, when we started having our family, be very careful and don't give your children too much because it will destroy their creativity. Well, I think, too, that uh, something that's being overlooked here is it, it takes money to raise a child, but is that the most important thing that it takes to raise a child? I mean, I, I think using creativity is very important to raise a child, and, you know, it takes creativity to use less money, and the opportunities that are involved with those things um, you know, just the, the work of doing laundry, the uh, wor work of preparing meals, of having different activities as a family, it also enriches the child's experience, not from money, but from experiences, from discussions, from planning, from explaining choices. And um, I think we can actually do a better job when when we have challenges facing us um, and enrich the child's life so that they have a better understanding of money and how to use it. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned, um, you mentioned using life insurance as a financial tool in building up the, the money that will be needed to, to help raise children. And, you know, with two out of five couples um, wishing that their spouse would buy more life insurance, it seems like there's plenty of room for this type of strategy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this just needs to be, you know, an, an understanding of how to use it. And so one of the questions that... Um, I was actually asked the other day from a grandparent looking to uh, build up money in a policy to help their future, uh, their, their grandchildren with college expenses in the future. They had a question for me the other day that I want to pose to you now. It says, do you have to repay the policy loan? And, and you could even rephrase that question, do you want to repay the policy loan? Um, can you talk about some of the pros and cons of that when you do use money from a, a policy to help raise a child, whether it's in the um, whether it's with life general life expenses, or whether it's with something like a college education, or um, or even wedding expenses. Well, when I was a little girl, my parents had a piggy bank for me, 
And, you know, so I would get a coin or two and I would put it inside that piggy bank. And underneath the bottom of the piggy bank, there was a rubber stopper. And you'd take it out and you'd take that money out and you would either put some in the bank or you would spend it or maybe do some of both. Did I want to put money back in the piggy bank? Well, yes, I sure did. Because if I wanted to access that piggy bank again, I wanted there to be something there. And so if you take a loan from a policy, no, you don't have to pay it back. You will need to pay interest as long as money is out of there. But if you want to be able to have more money in there to use at a future time, then yes, fill, you know, making payments back is going to fill it up. How quickly can you fill it up? Well, it depends how many little coins you're dropping into mm -hmm. that piggy bank. Same principles apply. Uh, just on a bigger scale. You know, when we started uh, learning from Mr. Nash about becoming your own banker, he said that we had to think like a banker. And um, I remember my dad helping me put on a roof, and he said, Tom, you've got to think like a raindrop. Otherwise, hmm. when you get the roof on, it's going to leak. And so you look at where a raindrop would go and how it would roll down that roof, and if it's got a place where it's directing it right underneath a shingle or right into a gutter where it's going to flood the house, you've got to figure a way to divert that raindrop. The same thing in, in, in the life insurance. Uh, we've got to start thinking differently about things in our life. So when a bank takes a deposit, it's a liability for them. When people have a child, they often think of it as a liability. Mm -hmm. A bank, when it loans money, thinks of that as an asset. And when we had our children and parents that are successfully raising children today, they don't see their children as a liability. They see that child as an asset. And our mindset is very, very important in this. If we see our children as assets, then the expense, whatever it is, is worth the cost. But when we see them as a liability, we just see it as an expense. And like one person who came to a garage sale one time of ours said, boy, I can't believe all your kids are still around here. I told my kids I was going to break their plate when they were 18 and they're gone. Hmm. Okay. I appreciate you didn't do that because we, we, we've been able to build something really cool um, as a family that we wouldn't have been able to build otherwise. We've be, we've been able to, you you have become far greater assets than we have ever thought, our children. So when I take a life insurance um, application for somebody, one of the questions that comes up is your net worth. And so um, usually we'll figure it up together. And so we add up their assets. And I'll often say, do you have any other assets? And I love it when I get the person who says, well, I have my children. Yes. And um, so, you know... That sometimes lets you know the values are in the right place. Yes, yes. So sometimes I'll say, do you have any other financial assets? But yeah, children really are an asset. And you know, what's not reported in that, what, 225000 that it takes to raise a child is all the pleasure and all the um, financial growth that can also be yielded because someone has children. Because you have told me many times, Tom, that when you have children, you are more motivated to work and earn so that you can take care of them. And so that is something that's less seen and is certainly not measured by these same people that are scaring with us with the figure of how much it's going to cost. Well, Michelle, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. I know that one of our um, uh, friends uh, who was a, a recent house guest told me that um, you have what every woman in America desires. You've got a family, you've got a career, and you've been a mother. And we get people so isolated into a career person or, or um, this or that instead of you really can have it all. Well, you know, Tom, I, you know, before I started helping you in this business, I really saw raising our children as my career. And so I prepared a schedule for the day. 
Um, not that it happened according to my schedule, but at least I knew a list of things that I wanted to get done besides all the regular things that happen. And I thought about long-term goals and um, it, working on a budget and all those different things. Um, and I set, set my hours that I was going to work and set hours that we were going to do certain things. Um, I really saw it as my career. And if I think if more people would really focus on uh, raising their children as something very serious and very productive, that they would have a lot better results. Well, thanks again for joining us today. And uh, you're listening to Wealth Talks. So we're going to be back here next week, just like we always are. You have a great week, and um, we just appreciate being able to serve and share on anything that we have gleaned from raising our children and managing the finances God has put in our life to help other people become more productive, more wealthy, both financially, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. Have a wonderful week. We'll be back next week.